is where we be. Last Sunday in the bulletin, I had something in there about drinking water. Going to have something again this Sunday about drinking water. About a year ago, what did we do? Was that about a year ago we did the uh, juicing thingy? Something would be easier if everybody started drinking a bunch of water. And a lot of, I got a book uh, yes, the other day. It says, you're not sick, you're dehydrated. And there's a lot of truth in that, a lot of truth in that. So as much as the Bible is supposed to be in our life, the Bible is portrayed as water, that's how much water is in it should be in our life. So, uh, and uh, I should go on a campaign against coffee. <laughs> coffee dehydrates you instead of hydrates you. And did you know who, in, who discovered coffee? Anybody know who discovered coffee? Muslims. Muslims, and it wasn't well known until a pope thought it was good, some priest and a pope, and then, then that's when it started becoming popular. So, you Catholic lovers. <laughs> little bit, a little bit. <laughs> so, now the thing. But uh, there's a lady that Lindsay takes care of, watches in the evening, and she was put in the care center down at Rensselaer in the Alzheimer's unit, and she didn't have it, but they would never give them water, which increases it. And we found out the reason why they wouldn't give them water is because they said some of the people's loved ones would come in and put poison in their water. So that's why they stopped giving them water. But I said, wow. <laughs> but uh, drinking water, very important. Okay, Daniel 2, and let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do <clears throat> ask that you'd help us to understand your words. <clears throat> help us to see that uh, the doctrine of this book, the prophecies of this book, uh, the power of this book, and a lot of things that said in here that we often overlook. And I pray that you'd help us to recognize that not only does this book help us spiritually, it helps us physically and mentally and emotionally. Uh, but <clears throat> Lord, help us to spend more time in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Daniel 2, you got a, a special king. <clears throat> he becomes a very unique king. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unique king, in that he becomes the first uh, international king. Okay, and Daniel too is going to have a dream, uh, and uh, God reveals is the guy righteous or unrighteous. Uh, I would say probably at this point of his life, we'd put him in the wicked realm because of all the murdering that's been going on in the battles. But still, here's a fellow that God revealed. Uh, some prophecies, too, that um, are fulfilled. One is in his lifetime, two after, and uh, then the others are obviously after his lifetime. So he was given some very unique things. So he had a dream. He forgot the dream. He got the wise men, his counselors, his advisors, his political advisors together and said, tell me what I dreamed and give me the interpretation. They said, tell us your dream. And he said, I forgot it, now tell me the dream. And they said, well, we can't do that. Nobody can do that. Only the gods can do that because that's what political figureheads do. They think they're getting advanced intelligence from lowercase g, gods. And this is the secret agreements that public officials have with certain beings, okay, and they're not going to let this be known, but this is what's going on. And those certain beings usually will demand blood in order to get this advanced intelligence, and this is why uh, you're hearing, hopefully you're noticing some scuttlebutt about children being abused, kidnapped, and all that stuff. Pizzagate. 
Okay, that's more prevalent than we know. And if you get into the court system, <clears throat> usually in the family courts, unfortunately, some of those judges are not as uh, wholesome as we think they are. Sometimes they're preying on their victims there. And so they're getting it from the gods. That would be in chapter 2, where they say this in verse 11. So we got down to about verse 14. So the prison, the, not the prison, but the um, guy in charge of them is coming to fulfill the order that he's going to have to, he's going to, have to execute He's going to have to execute these people. And he had a liken to Daniel. So Daniel asked him what's going on. Verse 14, Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captains, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Okay, there's that word hasty, or some say haste makes waste. Okay, a lot of times people act or respond too quickly about things, and then you waste it in emotion. (laughs) Okay, this is the problem with Facebook. Okay, the problem is that people get on there, and then they just spout their puny little brain, and then they got to backpedal about the things that they've written. Okay, I'm not... I'm not a person where I'm going to say Facebook's a sin or anything. Anything in the Internet can be used for good. It can be used for bad. Okay, but uh, this is the problem that people tend to do is they're looking at their little page and you get a like and you get a dislike and like and everything's revolving around that. But then they put their opinions in there and then somebody responds and then they got a quick answer all this stuff. Take your time in those things. Okay, don't respond so quickly, because then you always have to seem like you get a backpedal. Okay, and Proverbs fourteen twenty nine warns about being hasty about these things. Proverbs fourteen twenty nine. He that is slow to anger is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Okay, what's the modern word of that, hasty in spirit? Drama queens. Okay, drama queens. If, if you want to experience drama, drive a little church van with bus kids, and you will experience drama. Okay, and it's just a matter of trying to keep it all tame. So every Wednesday night, you know, Jan and I experience drama with these kids. Why? It's because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And so if so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that, or if they think they said that, they're going to react, and then they're going to discover they shouldn't, they didn't need to react that way. Okay, but in this case, the decree is hasty. Okay, he's going to go and execute all these um, counselors for the king. Verse 16, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now, that request about time was rejected by the king, but Daniel's asking again, and this time it was given to him. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Okay, so those are the, the other three. Uh, that eventually had their names or had their names changed, but they're still at this point calling them that. Eighteen that that they should desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So it wouldn't have been so bad if the rest of the wise men were to perish. That would have been okay. But Daniel and his buddies, that would not have been okay. Now, isn't it amazing how the tolerant left is so intolerant about tomorrow? Okay, and that's the same crowd here, okay, these wise men. These wise men really despise Daniel's three buddies, but uh, those three guys, those four guys are really going to save their lives. Okay, and the ones who are always screaming tolerance are some of the most intolerant people you ever know. And the reason why is because... They think their opinion means something. 
Okay, and if somebody thinks your opinion really means something and they're going to give you for you know, this is one thing I'd said to a fellow a few years back, and it just grated him so bad. It was when he was trying to give forth his opinion, which he demanded to be truthful, he was understood to be truthful. I just looked at him and said, hey, I hate to tell you this, but your opinion means absolutely nothing to me. And that was the worst thing I ever could have said to that fellow. How dare you? My opinion is truthful. <laughs> the world revolves around me. <laughs> okay, and this is why um, scholars get so upset if you tell them about their Greekifying, Greeky friars, that you don't agree with them. How dare you doubt their godly opinion? Okay, and this is, this is why Jesus said in, in the latter days, men shall be lovers of them own selves. And this is why people are so hypersensitive. You know, you say anything, you're going to offend somebody. And the reason why is they're madly in love with themselves. They think the world revolves around them. And if people get to realize and get in their head, take a five-gallon bucket, get an eyedropper, Put one drop in the bucket. Go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15, and it says all the nations are but a drop in the bucket. So all the world nations, so 7 billion people, there's one drop in the bucket. Make it a gallon bucket if you really want to feel better about yourself. Put one drop in the bucket. Look at that drop and say, I am one seventh billionth of that drop. Now that makes me important. Okay, we all need to realize that all of us are going to, be born, live our lives, die, 99.9% of the world will not even know we existed. You know, and that's a fact of life. But what we want to know is there's a God in heaven that knows we existed. That's what we want to know. So uh, these guys are now having to rely on Daniel's buddies. Okay, so what does Daniel do? Okay, Daniel, remember, he's, not, he's probably not 20 years old yet, so he's still a teenager in that range. If we run the math and look at the ages. Okay, so he went home to his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they prayed. They prayed to the God of heaven. Verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. So God gave him the answer. God gave him what he dreamed and what was going to be the interpretation. The interpretation of the dream is is the number one way to prove the Bible is the word of God. I can remember hearing in Bible classes, you know, to prove the inspiration of the Bible. And one of the arguments was usually because the Bible says it's the word of God. And in my spirit, I thought, so? I can say I'm a clown or I'm a, you know, a god, and that don't mean anything. Okay? Yes, the Bible does claim to be the Word of God. I agree with that. Okay, but that's not something that's going to verify to a skeptic that the Bible is the Word of God. What's going to verify to them that the Bible is the Word of God is the predictions of the Bible. The author of the Bible has gone into the future, looked backwards, and he writes about the the future in a historical setting. The author of the Bible knows the future and the past, okay? And the author of the Bible predicts the future in detail, writes it down. Man has the opportunity to disprove what is written down and can't do it. That's the God of the Bible. And the way God does these things is he'll make the prediction. He'll give the details depending on how many he wants to give to it. And then time marches on. And then he will start getting people to to get his ducks in a row. Now he'll get these people to get these ducks in a row so that his prophecies are fulfilled. Not by force, not by robot. He does that by putting thoughts in their head. He places these thoughts in their mind. They think about that, and they think it's an original thought. They act upon the thought. They think it's their idea, but it's God that gave them the thought. 
God can do that to an unsaved man. He can do that to a saved man. He could do it to a devil. Okay, Revelation chapter 17, verse 17 is the passage that shows that he is going to do this to demonic beings in order to have a one world government under the Antichrist. Now, the devil can do the same thing, but not, he's not as good as God. The devil can give us thoughts. He's the one that put into the heart of Judas, into his heart, the idea to betray Jesus Christ, John 13. So both God and the devil makes predictions. Both give thoughts to people to get the prediction fulfilled. But the devil doesn't have the capability that God does. Okay, Revelation 17, 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Okay, the there in that passage is the demoniac kings of the tribulation time period. The ten uh, kings that are going to fall under the authority of the Antichrist. Now, in their mind, they're not, they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to fulfill God's will because that's what I'm supposed to do in life. No, they're just going to act upon this idea that's given to them. But they don't recognize it's coming from God. To fulfill his will and to agree. That's when they accept the thought. And give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Okay, the idea of knowing that is that we need to be careful about the thoughts that come in our mind. Or we need to bring them in captivity. Okay, some people will say, well, I just speak my mind. Please don't do that. At least not all of it. Okay, why? Because all of us men will admit that some things that come through our mind is X-rated. We don't want anybody to see those things. Okay, so what proves the Bible is prophecy. Okay, now I say proves, but it's, it's, it's the laws of probability that are so beyond uh, anything else that's a miracle. But yet that's, that's how you prove the Bible to be authentic, to be the word of God. So Daniel is going to, he's going to get some prophecies. So when you get something from God, when you are enlightened about something, when you get understanding, uh, don't forget to thank God that he showed it to you because he doesn't have to. So what did Daniel do? Verse 19, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So express our gratitude to God that he revealed this to you. Okay, and because he's the source and then give him the credit. Give him the credit for the idea or whatever it is. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and that's a verbal blessing, which is what we can do as people. We could speak a blessing to people, not charismatic, but it's still the idea there. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Amen and amen. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Okay, in our culture, presidents, senators, congressmen, so forth, so on. Okay, God is involved in those things. Okay, so he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to, to them that know understanding. So there's the big three all through Proverbs, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Okay, if God can create an animal, a moose, with a huge, you know, horns and all that thing, and he can run through woods in the pitch black of night and not run into a tree, he's a God that's made things that can see in the darkness. Uh, a dog, amazing in its smell. Okay, God created those things. And so when God creates these things, he is showing us his power of his capability. 
Light, darkness, it's nothing to him. It's something to us. Okay, so with God, this is the thing about God that's totally unique, is that God knows our hearts, our intentions. And this is why a lot of people in their mind, they have fooled themselves into thinking that we can sin at nighttime because we can hide things better, but nothing's hid from God. But that's why a lot of sin goes on at nighttime. Okay, understanding, remember, understanding is the Bible definition or of inspiration when we understand something. So Daniel, in verse 20, 21, 22, 23, he is expressing great gratitude to God about revealing things to him. In verse 23, he says, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast made, now made known unto us the king's matter. So an answered prayer, an answered prayer is what's going to help you want to pray more, the answered prayer. And when you get an answer to prayer, don't kid me saying you had tremendous faith that you knew it was going to, faith that you knew it was going to be answered. When you get an answered prayer, you are surprised just like I'm surprised. And we're grateful to God. So this idea of expressing gratitude to God, and this takes us to Romans chapter 1, that one of the sins that is at the beginning of down the road to a reprobate mind is that they do not give glory to God and they're not thankful. Uh, was it one of the great inventors in the past? I think it was Samuel Morris where somebody was bragging to him about his great mind and how he has these inventions and all this stuff. And he, and he just kind of responded. He said, I don't know why you praise me for these things because of these things I learned from the Bible, a lot of these things I learned from the Bible, we should give praise to the God of the Bible. And in Proverbs 8, verse 13, it says God, or verse 12, gives us knowledge of witty inventions. And that's where Samuel Morris and a lot of those inventors got their ideas from, from the Bible. Okay, but then you got some of those inventors... A lot of times, great inventors are, are not good marketers. And so they often die poor. The geniuses often die poor, and the marketers die rich. And the marketers just take a product that somebody else invented, and they know how to market it. A good marketer was a guy named Kevin Trudeau. Remember that name? Boy, that guy was a marketer and a half. I mean, he would hook the bait, and he'd give you about 90% of it, and you only couldn't get, couldn't get to 10% until you bought into this and bought into that, bought into that, bought into that. Well, his marketing skills caught up to him, I guess. So he's in a gray bar motel right now. Okay, but uh, a lot of times these great inventors or the geniuses, you know, die very poorly. Uh, there's one that Dad listened to a lot in agriculture, a guy named Dr. Tejan. I heard Dad say the man's name so many times. He was, he was, you know, talked about chemicals of the ground, and he sold fertilizer, but he, he was such a bad salesman of fertilizer because he would admit any fertilizer will work if you just use to get the ground the right way. <laughs> Why? He was a very intelligent man, genius, okay, but not a good marketer. And so it's God that gives us knowledge of witty inventions. Okay, now, okay, verse 24. So he's got the answer. So therefore Daniel went into Ariach, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Okay, so notice interpretation is associated with understanding, verse 21 which is going to be associated with inspiration. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king uh, the interpretation. And the king answered and said to Daniel, okay, so obviously he walks in, and I don't know what the age of the king would have been at this time, and, he's, and he saw a kid walk in and probably hadn't even shaved yet. And you're going to give me the answers? Well, yeah. Yeah, but it's coming from God. He just happens to be using the 
base things of the world to confound the wise. That's, that's kind of his plan. That's usually how he does it. That way he gets the credit. So he comes in, whose name, okay, whose name was Belteshazzar. And he asked the question, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? He could have simply said, yeah, but he wanted to throw some more praise on God. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath de- uh, demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. What that's called is a dig. That's a dig. Okay? And those are kind of comical. You know, those clowns over there couldn't figure it out. Sorry, king. You know, I, uh, on YouTube, I've been going back and forth with some of these Greek friars. And, and uh, I asked him who Leviathan was. I said, rule, can't use the King James Bible. Tell me who Leviathan is using Hebrew and your fluency in Greek. He said he was fluent in Greek. And your um, Septuagint and your lexicon, and I threw in leprechauns. They always hate that when you throw the leprechauns in there. And, and he came back and said, nobody knows what it is. It's no big deal. And I responded, any sixth grader in the church that I pastor knows who Leviathan is after they three, read three verses. Why? God hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babies. That's what Je- that was the only record of Jesus rejoicing as far as the word rejoice is found in the New Testament, Luke 10, 21. I, I know he rejoiced other times, but the only time the word rejoiced is when Jesus rejoiced in spirit. And it says that God has hid these things from the wise and prudent revealed among the babies. The Lord thinks it's funny when worldly smart people don't get it and common, ordinary people do. You know, all this political stuff, so difficult, gun control, there's nothing difficult about any of that stuff. Just bring it down to common life and it's very simple. But they don't want to do that. So Daniel, he's taking a dig there. Not even 20 years old. He's taking a dig at those guys. And then he gives credit to God, verse 20. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And maketh known to the, to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So he's giving them prophecies. Okay, latter days, uh, not specifically last days, but he's talking about things that's going to take place in the future. Uh, The the ten toes, that feet one, that's going to be in the last days. Okay, and then he starts telling the dream. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon the bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Okay, that right there. If you would hold your finger here, go to Isaiah 41. There are two capabilities of God that he will usually uh, use to show that he's unique. And one is his creative powers, to create something out of nothing. Okay, that's one. Isaiah chapter 40, all the way through 48, is God talking about himself. So he'll use his creative power, he'll he'll refer to his power to create. In chapter 40, verse 12, 13, 14, and so forth. Okay, that's where he uses he he addresses that idea. Then in chapter forty one, he's uh, calling man or mankind into a debate, mankind and the pagan gods. And in this case, he's gonna he's going to appeal to his ability to prophesy. Chapter forty one, verse twenty one. He says, produce your cause. 
Okay, so it's like a court setting. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them, mankind, gods, new world order, United Nations, let them bring them forth and show us the Godhead. God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we, God, may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that ye may, we may be dismayed and behold it altogether. They said, Behold, ye are nothing. Do nothing. Ye are of nothing, and your work of naught, an abomination is he that chooseth you. So those two, uh, cre- the abilities of God to create out of nothing and to prophesy in detail and fulfill the prophecy, those are the two unique traits or qualities that God has that no other pagan deities have. Okay, in verse 20, 29, if the thought is really coming into Nebuchadnezzar's mind, I don't know if the thought comes into him and say, you mean I'm, I'm thinking about a being that is in my head, that knows what I think? That ought to bother me. He knows what I think? That's right. He knows what you dreamed. He's probably the one that put the dream in your head. You just followed his script. And that's something, uh, you know, we, all, we need to keep in mind about the God of the Bible. So prophecy, verse 29, verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed in me, to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. I like that. He's not, he's, he said, I'm not, I'm not smarter than anybody else. He said, I'm just like everybody else. But for their sakes that, uh, that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, okay, notice TH, singular pronoun. He's talking to one individual, and that's the preciseness of the King James Bible. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. And Nebuchadnezzar is sitting there saying, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, how did he get that? This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Yeah, well, man, it scared me to death. I couldn't sleep. And then he starts describing the image. And the more details he gets or gives, the more precise we see our God is. I mean, if he just had a generic thing and just gave a generic thing, maybe the king said, oh, yeah, 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 the sun came up, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's getting every details now, getting more details. He's sticking his neck out further. He could get a detail wrong here or there, but the more details he's giving, the more chance of it being wrong, but he's hitting it right in the head every time. So this image head was a fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. And at that time, never, yeah, 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 boy, you got it all. Man, I remember it now. I remember it. What's the interpretation? I believe you. Man, if a guy can go that far, yeah, I believe you. Now, you and I have an advantage when we read through this because we have hindsight as an advantage. Okay, so we know that as we come down through this dream, because of history, history is what verifies this dream. But think about this, that this was given, you know, around 600 B.C., maybe 606 B.C. 
And at that time, it, one, of the, uh, one of the international kingdoms was going to be Rome. And about that time, history says Rome was probably a town of about 500 people. And you're saying that this is going to be a world power at that time? Yeah, right. That's about like saying Mount Air is going to be a world power. Yeah. Mount Air don't even have a mountain. Okay. And so, uh, I mean, how, how God has these things is just phenomenal. Okay. And so now this is going to be the prediction. This is the interpretation. Okay, it's not one of many interpretations. It's not one of many opinions. This is exactly what God said it would be. And the interpreter of the Bible is the God of the Bible. The author of the Bible is the one who interprets the Bible. And remember that interpretation of the Bible or of a text is only necessary if it's complex or unclear. That's the only time interpretation is needed. Okay, when it becomes complex or unclear, where you can't really figure it out, interpretation takes something complex and makes it clear. That's what interpretation does. And that's what God allows us to do. It, it, it takes more brains to make something complex clear than it is to make something clear complex. Now, we know that government policy is to make something simple complex, to make it complex impossible. If you doubt it, look at the tax code. Okay, nobody understands that. And there's nobody that signs the tax code fully understands what they're signing. None of us do. We don't understand that. No attorney understands it. It is meant to be complicated. It's meant to confuse. Okay, that's its intended purpose. And its intended purpose is for the congressmen and senators to know the little ins and outs of it so they get by without paying anything. Where the ones who don't, then, you know, you're forking it over. So in the Bible, interpretation is only necessary if something's complex. And then when interpretation is fulfilled, the complex now becomes simple. And then you say, now that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no interpretation needed for that. That's easy. That's straightforward and plain. Now, the people say, what's your interpretation of that? What they're trying to do is they're trying to get out of it. It's like what Mark Twain said years ago. He said, the things in the Bible that bother me are not the things I don't understand, but what I do understand. And that's so true. Okay, and this is why people have a, a thing against the King James Bible. It's not because it's difficult. It's because it's in their face when they're reading it. And they don't like that idea. So we're going to... Start on the interpretation, uh, verse 36, about 10 till. We'll stop at verse 36, but then he's going to go, and of course, you and I have, again, the advantage of hindsight. And then it's going to take this, from this, it's going to go into Revelation. And then as we get further into Daniel, we're going to see in Daniel chapter 9, the, probably the greatest prophecy of the Bible, which is what uh, we really need to spend some time with. Okay, we'll stop there at verse 36 of the paragraph mark.